Hello, welcome, welcome, Leica fans and Leica fam. I am your host today, Antonio Benedetto, product specialist from Leica Camera USA. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here for another episode of Leica Conversations. Uh, we have a very special guest and a very special program. We are so happy to talk to you today. Uh, I am so excited. I think you can tell uh, because I want to jump right into it so quickly because we have a very special guest uh, from headquarters from Leica Camera in Wetzlar. Um, and that man who you can see is already is, uh, is here um, is Stefan Daniel, uh, our global director of uh, product division photo for Light Camera AG at Lights Park in Wetzlar, Germany. Um, Stefan has worked for Leica for over 35 years. Uh, he started out as an apprentice in precision mechanics with lights. Uh, he became a trusted mentor in the repair department and worked his way up through the years. Uh, he's been nicknamed uh, Mr. M. Uh, by some in the company for his dedication and work to helping foster new innovations for the legendary rangefinder system from Leica. Uh, he's now a pivotal executive with Leica Camera AG, overseeing product management and shaping the successful product portfolio of Leica Camera that must always look to the future while still maintaining the longstanding legacy of Leica's history. Uh, so with that being said, uh, Stefan, thank you so much uh, for being here with me today uh, to talk about uh, all things Leica, but in particular, we've got something new and special to talk about. Thank you, Stefan. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to, to pass uh, the next hour with you and um, to spend the next hour with you. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I think we're going to have a nice, uh, nice chat and you will see some funny pictures and uh, we prepared um, some answers to your questions. So I, hopefully you will have a good time. Yes, uh, I, I, it's always a treat to talk to you, Stefan. Uh, as I mentioned in, in your little intro, uh, you know, you've been with Leica for uh, quite a while, and it's really been a, a love affair since the very beginning. And you mentioned some some funny pictures. We have uh, a couple of, uh, of oldies but goodies that you share with us because you wanted to, you know, pick your brain about, about product, but also uh, maybe get to know you a little bit for a moment. Um, I believe you first held your Leica at age 12. Uh, and you started working with Leica at what age? Yeah, it, uh, I first got my hands on a Leica, yeah, uh, age 12. This was a Leica Flex SL2. Um, I still remember that moment when I got the virus, so to say. And um, yeah, uh, this picture, uh, funny enough, is taken in the repair shop uh, in Paris, um, early 90s. Mm -hmm. And and you you had also a really a really interesting story of when while well, even back when you were an apprentice uh, you started at age sixteen um, you got a little preview of something something that a lot of us uh, yeah fans that's, hold, that was hold, actually hold near and dear really funny uh, funny thing uh, I still remember uh, I started in August nineteen eighty four and in September was Photokina. Uh, the leading fair for, for cameras, et cetera, in Cologne, Germany. And our master of the apprentice workshop was so nice to show us the brand new M6 before it came out uh, to all uh, the apprentices. So that was a special moment when I uh, saw the M6 before it even came out. That's amazing. And I, I hold my own personal M6. I think many of us still cherish these cameras. They're still very, very much sought after. It's many people's favorites. Um, and now you, you then, you worked in, in repairs. You had your hands on uh, many, many cameras. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, did, you, did you choose to go into repair because you just love cameras? Yeah, I was always, uh, yeah, wanted to get my hands on cameras. Uh, and I thought the repair department um, was a good place to do so. Um, so this picture, of, uh, for example, is taken at the photo festival uh, in Arles in southern France. And uh, we always had a repair clinic there. And you see me with the Leica R3. And the R3 was my special yeah, camera I, I was specialized in. I did 400, 450 cameras um, I serviced uh, that way. Wow. Uh, so now, 
it, it's I find it amazing that um, is it accurate to say that Leica is pretty much the only job you've had? You could say so, but uh, it, uh, it, it got never boring because uh, the company and the times changed uh, so much uh, over the, all these years. Um, from working in Wetzlar in a company called Lights, uh, then going to Zones um, uh, a little further down the Lahn River, uh, and then going back uh, six years ago uh, right now um, with um, uh, the return to Wetzlar. Yeah, it's uh, always has been fun, and um, also I have to say a big honor uh, to participate in that long-lasting story of Leica. That's amazing, and and yeah, it's so interesting that you yeah you've been there for you've worked at Wetzlar, then Solms, then then Wetzlar again, um, and for those uh, have, that have had the the pleasure or the luxury of going to to Lights Park in Wetzlar, it really is. Uh, an amazing experience. Uh, I encourage all. I think there are the worst places to work. <laughs> it really is a beautiful facility uh, and everything is really quite, quite special about it. It's hard not to get inspired uh, when you're there uh, and then go down the hill and see, you know, the spot where one of the earliest photos from Oscar Barnack was taken. Um, so I, I appreciate these, uh, these insights and it's a bit of your history, uh, Stefan. And um, I, I know that uh, history, of course, is a big important part of, of the Leica brand. Uh, and I just think it's so amazing that, you know, someone like you has kind of, you know, worked, you're such an amazing story that you've worked your way up uh, through the company and, and, and have so much experience with it. But I do have to say, I think many of our viewers are here uh, to learn from you, but also because we have a new product that we just announced last week, uh, the Leica M10R. Um, and I'm sure people are already chomping at the bit to learn whatever new information they can about the camera. I'm sure they've been, you know, checking out reviews and, and uh, early, uh, early press as well as uh, the content we've released so far. Um, so how about we jump into the camera and you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, let, let's leave the history aside and um, move forward to the present and the future. Yeah, again, history, uh, because the M3 was presented in 1954 at uh, Photokina, once again. Um, so that was the first M model. And yeah, over the time, every M camera kind of uh, represented a pinnacle uh, of innovation and on the other hand, concentrating on the essentials of photography. And what we did um, three years ago or three and a half years ago, uh, we launched the M10. Uh, in January uh, 2017, um, which was, yeah, uh, many people say it's a perfect M camera, um, but then we went even more perfect with the M10P, uh, uh, with the silent shutter, touch display, and very unobtrusive design. We had uh, the M10D without the display, um, giving it's the most puristic approach uh, to photography, digital photography, of course. Mm -hmm. And then followed by the M10 monochrome uh, earlier this year, also in January, uh, with the new 40 megapixel monochrome sensor. And now it's time to welcome another member of uh, the M10 family, uh, the M10R, uh, which we officially announced Thursday last week with the 40 megapixel color sensor. So that is the main news in that camera, uh, that we have uh, increased resolution by 70%. And uh, yeah, a lot of effort has been gone into the design of that sensor to make it yeah, more resolution, but on the same time, not giving up on high ISO capability or on dynamic range. And um, we have uh, quite some questions about that. I will come to that later when uh, these uh, questions will appear on the screen so that we can de 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 yeah, answer that in detail. Mm -hmm. um, because um, we didn't want to give up on the quality of high ISO, dynamic range, and so on. Also not the sharpness in the corners, uh, very important to an M camera and the M lenses. Uh, and I think we kind of achieved that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, yeah. Go ahead. So uh, on the other uh, specification, you could say um, the M10 
R is the accumulation of all uh, the best we have in our M10 family, meaning that uh, we have the thin M10 body design everybody uh, loves so much. On, uh, we have the dedicated ISO wheel. Uh, we took the silent, extremely silent shutter from the M10P. Also the uh, touchscreen display. So we kind of uh, put it all together with the new sensor in the M10R. And, and I know, you know, I like to joke that uh, the M10R we've reached, we're like maximum M10. We're like, we reach peak M10 uh, with the M10R in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in a nutshell, um, a new sensor, a CMOS sensor, of course, uh, we have a base ISO of 100. Uh, the ISO goes up to 50K. I would say usable, really with low noise and really nice quality up to 12 and a half K. Um, and I would, would only use 25 and 50 uh, if there is absolutely no light, yeah. Uh, another advantage we could um, implement with the M10R are long exposures up to 16 minutes. Of course, the camera is made in Germany as every M camera. Uh, we have the thin M10 body design, the silent shutter, the touch, play, uh, touch display, and not to forget um, the seamless Leica photo, photos connectivity. I've been shooting a wedding this morning and I was so happy to be able to share the first pictures even without editing uh, uh, to uh, the bride and the groom. Um, so uh, then they were completely happy and uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it was a, f a fun experience. Uh, I wa how did you get the images out of their camera? Yeah, that was um, thanks to Leica Photos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that, that's fantastic. It's amazing that you were, you know, just doing that today. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the M10R has so much to offer, which we're really excited to talk about. And I think, you know, ultimately, I think the, the, the proof is in the pudding, as we say here in the States sometimes. Uh, you know, so I, we have a few more images uh, to, to show. Uh, something that, you know, maybe people have seen these images come across uh, that they're provided from the Leica Academy in Germany, uh, many of which, some of which were taken with this lens you see on screen right now, the uh, APO Summicron M uh, aspherical 50 millimeter, uh, an amazing lens, definitely a, 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 a quite a gem of, of our lineup. Um, and, you know, we have some examples here uh, with uh, some test shots that also have some, some large crop, uh, heavy crops to show just how much resolution you can get with 40 megapixels, how much our lenses uh, you know, can, can resolve uh, at 40 megapixels, which is uh, quite, a, quite amazing. Um, I'll, I'll, of course, add the disclaimer that we're you know, transmitting via Zoom and there's probably some compression happening, but uh, yeah, I think the sharpness uh, is, is quite, quite amazing. Um, then we see, uh, Another one, so I like how you know, we have some examples in the center of the frame, but also some examples uh, towards the outer edge of the frame. Uh, and this is where, you know, uh, of course, most lenses can you know, show their weak points. Uh, we wanna highlight how we have so many lenses that, that are still strong out to the edges of the frame. Another thing we, we do acknowledge is that people adapt our lenses to other systems, uh, but ultimately you're gonna get the best results uh, from, you know, uh, using an M lens uh, on uh, a Leica camera uh, because it's outfitted for, uh, you know, for our sensor and our sensors are, are designed for it. Uh, so again, just a few examples, those with the 50 millimeter uh, F2 APO uh, and here one with the 35 millimeter um, uh, uh, Sumalux uh, F1.4. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, quite impressive what you can get in, uh, in micro contrast uh, and in uh, the quality, even out towards the edges of the frame. But we still, as Stefan, as you mentioned, we, we still maintain uh, you know, great high ISO performance. Um, I agree with you. I think you know, 12,500 is actually quite usable. Uh, I always, anyone that's spoken to me before about noise and I've ever spoken with, I always say noise is a bit subjective because everyone has a bit of a different, different tolerance level for noise, maybe depending on what you're outputting to, um, you know, I've posted some very, very noisy images to Instagram that you would, you just can't see that noise when, it's, you know, that tiny. <laughs> um, but here we see an example at ISO 6400 uh, that is, uh, yeah, quite, uh, quite clean, uh, quite great color as well. It's also important. 
I think that's, uh, that that's one of the more important things uh, to mention is that mm -hmm. it's not only uh, well controlled noise, but also the colors are still there, even at mm -hmm. uh, 6400 here in that example. Yeah, yeah, it's a very important part that sometimes gets overlooked is, uh, yeah, color at, at, at high ISO. Um, so and you mentioned this this new feature as well. This brings it in line with the uh, its sibling, the M10 monochrome, right? We can do now a 16-minute long exposure. This is something personally kind of near and dear to my heart because I, I like doing long exposures at night uh, from time to time when I can. Um, and, you know, I've done it with the M240. I even did it some time ago with the M9. Um, and nowadays I've been usually picking the SL, now the SL2 as my, my, my weapon of choice, we'll say, for long exposures. Uh, but, you know, now I, we have more options with the M10R and M10 monochrome. And you see an example here uh, of a 16-minute exposure um, with a flash popped in the, in the remote. Um, so just a few uh, image examples uh, to whet your appetite, folks. Um, I see people are already popping off in the, uh, in the Q&A and in the chat. So uh, great. Thank you so much. We're uh, going to triage some you know, questions from uh, the live Q&A. Uh, and, and we'll see. We'll try to make our, uh, our, some time at the end to ask Stefan some further questions live. But uh, we've actually been getting some questions early ahead of time. Uh, from the Leica community. So I have to give some extra special thanks to uh, our friends at LHSA, Leica Historical Society of America, the Leica Society, uh, as well as the M10 user group on Facebook. Uh, we got some great questions from them. And uh, yeah, Stefan, if you're okay, let's maybe jump into some, some Q&A with you. Yeah, I'll do my best. Okay. All right. I promise not to, not to make it too hard to start. We'll, get, we'll, get, we'll work our way to the hard questions. Uh, <laughs> So how about we start with, is the M10R now shipping? Yes. Now that's a bit maybe too short answer, but uh, yes, we are producing, we're shipping. Um, but we have uh, also uh, some issues due to the corona uh, yeah, pandemic. Uh, so sourcing is not so easy, but uh, we'll do our best to supply in decent quantities. Um, so there could be some, some waiting, but uh, we're producing the camera and it's yeah, basically available. And I see just the chat, uh, somebody has got it already. So great. Yeah, I saw that yes. feedback as well. So a bit of a, a spoiler there, but yes, it's shipping. And, and uh, yeah, please, if you, if you uh, are interested in one, it might be best to put your name down on a, uh, on a list, uh, you know, at a Leica store, or boutique or dealer. Um, okay, another, another uh, easier question to start off. Uh, is there currently an Adobe Camera Raw profile available for the M10R? Yes, it's, it's also available. Uh, I think they, they had an update a couple of weeks ago and it was already contained. So um, yeah, it, it works. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, I, I, I also, uh, I'll, I'll mention I've been, you know, editing using the M10R myself. I have one uh, here, actually. Um, I'm, I promise that this is not a humble brag and I'm not trying to flex, uh, but uh, I've been, you know, using it. And, and when you go into the develop module, you actually see profile like M10R comes up automatically. So yeah, helpful to, to, to have it all baked in. Uh, and oops, sorry, I skipped one. So what is another easy one? What's the native ISO of the new sensor? Yeah, it's ISO 100, so this is the native ISO, which uh, is, I have to say, is nice because you can shoot wide open even in daylight in most situations, so, and then getting the benefit of a, of a nice bokeh. Yeah, fantastic. And it's also, I, I love how, yeah, we have that nice low base ISO, and it, it also kind of helps the monochrome in a way because the monochrome is uh, 160. Uh, which is like kind of new territory for the, the monochrome to keep a low ISO. So it's great to have yeah, both yeah. around there. Okay, now something a little bit, uh, a little bit harder for you, Stefan, something a little more pressing. Uh, how does the M10R sensor architecture differ from the M10, M10P, and M10D? Uh, and and this, this question asker specifies further, uh, previous M sensors were designed with uh, buckets, we put in quotes, uh, tailored for Leica's wide angle lenses. Is this still the case? So I gave you the easy questions and now we, I'm pushing you right into the deep end. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, so first of all, the M10, M10P and M10D all have the same sensor. It's a 24 megapixel uh, CMOS sensor. 
uh, the M10R has a completely new design. So uh, the resolution increased by 70% uh, from 24 to 40 megapixels, or almost 41, because it's uh, 40.89 uh, million pixels. And um, so we took um, great care of, um, as I already mentioned, not to, not to give away ISO, not to give away dynamic range. Um, and we did that uh, with a couple of measures, maintaining the quality even with a smaller pixel surface. Uh, first is that we um, increased uh, the uh, active area in relation to the non-active area. So if you would take a 24 megapixel, um, a one pixel, and you have a relation between the active light sensitive area and the non-active area, which is where the electronics are to amplify the signal and to get it out to the processor. And if we would just have copied the 24 megapixel design and shrinked it, um, the active area would have simply become too small. Uh, and then the result would uh, actually have been a lower ISO capability. So what we did is we um, shrinked the non-active area to give more space to the light sensitive area. That's number one. Number two is that the pixel surface itself, independent from the size, can do more, uh, can capture about 10% more photons. That is uh, very important if, um, uh, that's very important for the dynamic range. And the dynamic range on the camera is absolutely great, I can tell you. The third thing is that we um, use a dual gain technology. Dual gain means that um, at the uh, the signal, the electric signal coming out of the pixel is amplified directly at the pixel and not later in the imaging chain, which also is very good uh, because you don't lose ISO, because if you do it later, you will add noise on, on that way till the amplification. So it's amplified at the pixel itself, or right after the pixel, I have to say, to be precise. And the fourth um, topic is, um, and even I didn't know because I'm not an engineer, is before the pixel was not completely symmetric. Um, I think there was a kind of a small notch uh, on, on one side. Uh, and so this notch is gone so that the uh, pixel design is more symmetric. Uh, and this makes it better from uh, light coming from different angles. So. Um, you see there was a lot of uh, thinking behind how to achieve higher resolution without uh, losing on other topics. Wow, yeah. And uh, of course, to answer that question, um, yes, um, uh, the performance with Leica wide-angle lenses is still great um, and uh, no reason to worry about using uh, Leica wide-angle lenses on that camera. Gotcha. That's there's obviously a lot has gone into the sensor and the development of it, testing of it. And, and would you say that a, a lot of it, this much effort has to go into every M sensor? In terms Basically, of, uh, this you know, is go, goes back to the M8 where we already tailored this sensor to work best with M lenses. And my, uh, my colleague, Peter Carver always said, uh, we adapted the digitalization to the M system and not the other way around. So uh, it was always um, mandatory for us that um, the M lenses people might have in their uh, yeah in their position that they work nice with uh, with a new camera coming up in the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great. Uh, and, 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 you know, I think uh, there, there's a lot of technical details, uh, you know, people in the chat, feel free to, to share uh, if, uh, if, if you got all that or if, uh, you know, uh, you feel free to discuss amongst yourselves too uh, what you know about sensors and, and all these details. It's, uh, it's quite detailed. 
Um, and I'm sure, Stefan, you could probably even go way over our heads uh, with some even further details. But we have so many great questions that we're going to continue on. So thank you, Stefan, for that great and elaborate uh, ex uh, expression of what makes this architecture so unique uh, and, and why we went to these great lengths. Uh, we've got Hopefully another... I haven't been too technical. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. No, not, I don't think so. Um, so now another another great question, uh, and also fairly technical. But but you, you you even you know brought up the M8 and previous cameras, and I think something that always has to go into M cameras is a, a, a special attention to the cover glass that's used on the M sensor. So what can you tell us about the cover glass construction for this new high resolution sensor in the M10R? Yeah. So um, the um, uh, uh, the cover glass also is quite. Uh, quite special because this time we use a, a dual glass. Um, as you might know, uh, the cover glass design of an M camera has always been special because usually for other brands and most cameras in the market, the, the typical layout is that you have the pixels, then you have a clear cover glass. Uh, on top of that, you have an IR cut filter and uh, last but not least, you have a low pass filter or anti-aliasing filter. And this is the typical pack of um, glass in front of a sensor. And this would not work at all with an M camera, especially with the M lenses with a very steep incident angle. So from the beginning, from the M8, we also, we always looked at making the cover glass as thin as possible. So, um, and this time we did that even with two uh, layers of glass. And the two layers uh, is one is an IR cut and the other one is an UV uh, cut filter. And they are cemented together. Uh, and the total thickness is only 0.9 millimeters. So that we keep a very good um, resolution and, um, and avoid an undesired refraction at the borders of the image. So this is um, a new technology. It's also uh, patent pending. Um, so, and it makes the M sensor absolutely unique. And um, I don't know about other uh, of our competitors uh, putting so much effort to make a camera work with lenses which are 20, 25 years old or 50. Right. Yeah. yeah so, so this also goes to all the care that has to go into it uh, because we stick with a lens mount that's over 60 years old, right? Yeah, actually 1954 uh, with the M3. And uh, yeah. still it's uh, great fun to use older lenses on the, uh, also on the new M10R. Yeah. Yes. I can, I can also, uh, speak from some personal experience that I personally like using some classic lenses once in a while, like this, my little, uh, my screw mount, uh, Elmar 35 millimeter F 3.5, which is, uh, about almost, almost as, sh as short as a body cap. <laughs> uh, and, and I've been using it on the M 10 R and it can yield some really fun, really, really special results. Cause cool, cool character that that lens has. And it's, it's like, it makes the camera so light. Um, Okay, so we've got another question that I think runs a little bit parallel to some of what you've been talking about with the sensor and, and the developments and, and what you try to accommodate. Um, one one uh, question from LHSA is, is there increased vignetting to worry about with wide angle lenses uh, with the higher resolution of the M10R? Yeah, there, there is no increased uh, vignetting. So um, first of all, we also use the pixel. I forgot to mention that the pixel design itself is quite flat. That means also if the flatter it is, the more it will accept light rays from a steep uh, angle. Um, mm -hmm. And that makes the um, vignetting getting better. Of course, there is natural vignetting from the lenses itself. The sensor is not, not responsible for that. Uh, and even this vignetting, we're able to correct by, because most of the lenses have six bit coding and um, we have um, an old story but I always tell it here's a sensor also next to the red dot yeah 
this is a light meter, external. Um, we have the TTL metering here through the lens. And the camera will calculate the difference between the both and therefore detect the aperture. And depending on the aperture, because at, uh, when the aperture is closed, there is very little vignetting. If it's open, there is more. Uh, the camera uh, will detect that and apply correction uh, so that you uh, do not see vignetting uh, uh, at an undesired level. But many people like vignetting a lot. Uh, it's become kind of a uh, Instagram filter or something. Um, so um, sometimes uh, it's also not bad to have some vignetting. Uh, you can easily switch that on and off uh, if you switch off the uh, auto lens detection. Right, the profiles, and and it speaks to the the helpfulness of uh, and 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 benefit of using a six bit coded lens, uh, you know, and 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 having that on the camera. It's convenient because you can, of course, it detects automatically. You can dial in your lens manually if you if you don't have a six a six bit coded version. Uh, so that's always uh, good to keep in mind. Uh, but another example of why you know you get the best results with Leica lenses on on a Leica camera, and part of the you know the six bit coding is kind of part of that. Uh, so thank you, Stefan. It's a great explanation. Uh, now we've got another question. Uh, again, many of these are, are about the sensor because everyone's just uh, you know, so fascinated with what we've brought to the M10R with 40 megapixels. Is Leica sourcing the M10R sensor from a different vendor than the Q2 and SL2 sensors? Yeah, it's, a, it's always a, a question. Be a try, people try to tease me on that. So we're not disclosing vendors uh, of our uh, parts in the camera. Uh, I think also one day would would be yeah would go maybe too far uh, that people maybe ask uh, where the copper from for the brass of the top cover comes from uh, from which mine um, so um, uh, we use a different sensor you can easily see that in the number of megapixels and um, because this sensor as I explained for the M10R needs to be so special. Um, and for Q2 and SL2, uh, we slightly more off the shelf, still customized, but slightly more off the shelf. Gotcha. Um, I, I appreciate your candor, and and, and uh, I, I know people always want to know. Uh, it's become a, a hot topic uh, for many cameras out in the market, not just ours. Um, but we we know that uh, just if you were to say what who made the sensor, who made the, the, the silicon, who made the, the wafer that it came from, that still doesn't tell the whole story. Um, you know, because as we've discussed, uh, an M sensor has to be kind of a custom affair, as you so eloquently described in the uh, description of what goes into the cover glass. I totally goes into yeah, I totally understand that request, but in the end, what counts is image quality. Fair enough. Uh, so I've got another question then, which again, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna push you a little bit. Will, will you give us some info? Let's see. Uh, can Leica share a lens roadmap for upcoming M lenses? Yeah, it's another teaser, but uh, still this time I, I could not resist. Um, there will be very interesting new lenses coming up. Um, not this year, but maybe early next year, uh, I can tell you. But uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I, I can't be more specific. Okay, no, no worries, Stefan. I had, I had to try. <laughs> um, uh, all right, so this is something that we, we've kind of talked a little bit about already, but um, how do older lenses perform on the new high megapixel sensor? Um, and I'll give a shout out, actually, I saw someone talking in the chat uh, that's uh, said they've been using uh, our lenses, uh, which I think are maybe near and dear to you, Stefan, as you worked on, on our cameras a lot uh, in, back in your heyday uh, at, at, the, at the bench. Uh, now, he, someone said that they use our lenses on their SL2 uh, and, and is maybe excited to try out uh, our lenses on the M10R as well. Uh, so how do these older lenses perform? Are there any drawbacks to using older, say, M lenses or adapted screw mount lenses on this new 40 megapixel sensor with the M10R? So we also have been curious to try it out when the first prototypes were available. And um, what we found out is that the specific character of a lens, um, the, you could call it a signature of a lens, this even comes out a bit stronger. 
And mm -hmm. actually, I would say this is an advantage because I was so lucky to, to be able to use an old uh, Noctilux 1.2. And I absolutely wow. love that lens on uh, the M10R because um, at 1.2, it's quite soft. It's still sharp, but uh, you have that super blurry look. And if you stop it down, uh, I was amazed how good the resolution really is. So um, I would say, yes, older lenses are usable uh, on the M10R. Uh, but of course, if you want to have uh, a pinpoint sharp um, picture, like we've, we've shown the couple of pictures with the little castle and so on, uh, if you want to have that uh, resolution power and that image quality wide open, then you should better go for a more recent design, uh, such as the Apple 50 millimeter uh, Summicron or the 35 f1.4 does a great job. So all the, mm -hmm. the lenses I would say we've been bringing out the last 10 to 15 years um, easily can cope with a resolution at a full extent. So at full open aperture. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think it speaks to, again, I think we've been talking about where we, we have to, you know, uh, acknowledge and, and consider our history uh, with everything uh, because uh, like has been around for so long and the history and legacy is an important part of everything that we do. Um, so yeah, I, I, again, I speak from personal experience using uh, that old uh, 35 millimeter Elmar. Uh, and, you know, for those that, that may not be aware, we've, we've kind of re-released some um, some classic lenses uh, like this one here. This is the 28 millimeter uh, Sumeron f5.6, another super compact uh, screw mount era lens that came back. We brought it back in the uh, M mount. Uh, my personal favorite, this version, this is the, the matte black paint because I love how it's uh, kind of an anachronism. It's a classic looking lens, but in black, it looks you know more modern uh, and really interesting and fun. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, a strong consideration for uh, our classic lenses for our history. Um, and I think generally speaking, if, you know, if you've got a lens, Stefan, like you said, last 10, 15 years, I mean, if it's got a spherical or Apo in the name, I think that's a, it's usually a good qualifier that you've, you've got some, uh, some heavy hitting image quality yeah. from Leica, uh, no matter what year it came out. The amazing thing really is how good these lenses were like 40, 50, 60 years ago. This was, and nobody would have dreamt of a resolution like this, but yeah, still, it works. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I think uh, again, with using screw mount lenses, the you know obviously they never could have dreamt back then of what we could do now with you know with, where digital photography would come in, but what their lenses and would be able to do uh, in the future. That's like we're we're maintaining the legacy of those lens designers just as we maintain the legacy of Leica. So I think it's a uh, yeah something that gets you a bit excited. It's something cool uh, to be a part of. Um, so. Uh, Another technical question uh, about the M10R, now shifting away from uh, sensor talk for a moment. Uh, how does the battery life compare to the M10 and M10P? Uh, is a higher megapixel sensor more taxing on a battery? I have to say slightly, yes. Uh, it's about 10% more consumption. Uh, that simply has to do with uh, computing more pixels. Um, uh, but still using the rangefinder mode, uh, being careful on the, on the live view, you can easily say, yeah, around 500 uh, images per battery are easily uh, feasible. And um, also if you switch off the camera after uh, taking a shot, then you can save a lot of battery. So it is a, a bit more than the M10, about 10% more consumption. Gotcha. And I'll speak from some personal experience here. Um, you know, I think I've been shooting with the M10R, as I mentioned, and, you know, yesterday I was using it just a little bit. Um, I, I left it in my bag and I actually forgot to turn it off. And, you know, the power saving bailed me out. It, it took care of it for me. I turned it on today. I just tapped the shutter and I was still at 95% uh, after only taking a, a few frames yesterday. So that, the, the default, I find personally the default power saving uh, modes to be quite helpful. Um, and you know, as I bring it to my eye, I'm just I just give the shutter a half press, make sure it's uh, it's awake, uh, and that always works out well for me, and really does uh, help you stretch that battery much much longer uh, throughout a full day of shooting. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Also, um, something 
people should should be aware of that the full battery capacity is only achieved by charging it five to ten times uh, to go let it let it drain completely and fully recharge it then you get the, the full full power so a new battery um, is always a bit less uh, and it becomes better uh, with a couple of cycles gotcha okay good tidbit thank you um, okay, another another question. Now, this one, uh, the, you know, we all know that the the M10R kind of has now, in a way, its older sibling because the the monochrome M10 monochrome came first. But uh, you know, the M10R and the M10 monochrome, of course, share 40 megapixels as their resolution and have similar sensors. Uh, I say similar, of course, not the same. Uh, can you comment then on the the difference between black and white conversions with the M10R versus uh, a native black and white image uh, taken with the M10 monochrome? So I have to say that the sensor of the M10 monochrome and the M10R and even the Leica S3 are pretty similar. So the pixel design, the pixel architecture itself is the same. When it comes, where the difference is, is that the M10R has, of course, a buyer pattern. We have the color filters and the M10 monochrome does not. Um, so by leaving those color filters away, um, more light comes onto the pixels because that eats about two third to one f stop. So, still, the M10 monochrome has a higher ISO capability. Yeah, it goes up to uh, 100,000. And therefore, um, you have one basically one f stop more. And uh, the same is also true for the resolution because uh, still. Uh, this RGB uh, thing has to be interpolated so that the camera is able to see color. So if you don't need that interpolation, uh, your image uh, looks a lot sharper and it actually is also uh, measuring it. Uh, so there is still an advantage in ISO and resolution uh, over the color version um, with the M10 monochrome. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I can, again, from um, the experience side then too, and I, I'm sure you echo this as well, or feel, maybe you feel similar. Um, when I shoot the M10 monochrome, there's all the technical advantages are, are at my disposal with the images, but you know, it's also, I shoot differently. There's the intangibles. And you know, if I set any color camera to black and white mode, or, or I think this will, I'll, I'll put this later for black and white, um, I still take those pictures uh, differently. And uh, you know, I, I find that then I'm using the M10 monochrome, and I start to look for more textures. I start to look for, you know, I start to think in black and white, uh, yes. and I feel yeah. like it helps my photography uh, in some ways. It helps motivate me too. Um, and and I just want to give a shout out. I saw someone in the chat um, mentioned as a pro who has shot with all brands and types of cameras that they're amazed at the high ISO capability of their M10 monochrome, uh, and said it is truly impressive. Uh, so yeah, shout out to the chat. Um, all right, we also have some questions. Thank you everyone at LHSA. Uh, but we also uh, pulled some questions from uh, the M10 user group on Facebook and we appreciate everyone there. Some great conversations have been happening there and I got some great feedback from people. Uh, so with smaller pixels on the M10R, uh, this person is concerned about, again, similar to what we, what we talked about earlier, uh, softness in the corners uh, of, of wide angle lenses like the 28 Summicron. Um, could you share your thoughts on these possible drawbacks of the 40 megapixel sensor? I know that we said, you know, vignetting is, is accounted for and we're good in the corners. Uh, what about any softness in, in some of our wide angle lenses? I would say that I have to say, if you enlarge the picture to the same extent, the image will look exactly the same. The only point is that you can enlarge it even larger. Yeah. Without, uh, uh coming to, yeah, coming to a limit. I would not expect to be uh, that the 28 Summicron is a is an issue, um, especially it's also one of our later designs. Um, so from that perspective, no worries, uh, it would work fine. Gotcha. Um, and and also I'll I'll further highlight that this is a uh, you know people adapt our our M lenses to other systems, and this is where usually those lenses then the. the those sensors show their faults because they're not tuned to our lenses like we do. Um, so if you take that 28 Summicron or especially with lenses wider than that uh, and use it on another, uh, say a mirrorless camera, uh, not made by Leica, um, 
yeah, I mean, you're going you're gonna to get a nice image, sure, but uh, you are losing some of the potential uh, capabilities uh, of, of that lens. And you're, no, you're definitely no longer going to get the full potential of what it can deliver and its maximum. That has, to do, that has to do with the three uh, layers of glass I, I mentioned earlier. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so we've got a few more and then we'll, we'll take maybe some questions. I see there's been some great questions uh, here in our live Q&A and also people uh, talking in the chat. Um, so with the increase in resolution on a manual focus system like the M, uh, is accurate focusing now harder? Uh, is, and what about, especially with telephoto lenses? So what we did is we uh, overworked the uh, rangefinder uh, with the introduction of the M10 back in 2017. Um, it's kind of been not really been recognized, uh, but um, we, we spend a lot of effort uh, making the um, rangefinder more precise over the previous models by uh, shrinking tolerances, adapting new materials. So it looks quite the same uh, on on paper or if you would disassemble a camera, but in fact, it's a new design. So the M10 rangefinder is uh, able to focus the 40 megapixels precisely. That's the first thing. But of course you have to work accurate. Yeah, uh, not just um, like this. And uh, for telephoto lenses, I still would recommend uh, to use either a viewfinder magnifier or uh, correction lenses if you have um, some eye, eyesight problems, or simply go for the Visoflex um, to use it in live view. Um, that also will give you a high level of security. But of course, then it's not a Rheinfeld camera anymore, uh, which I understand uh, people not looking for buying an M and use it with the EVF. So, um, but the answer is yes, um, it works fine. Gotcha. Um, and, and I have to agree. I think, you know, it's, uh, I've been seeing great results, uh, even with a 75 Noctilux, um, which is, uh, you know, can be a tricky lens to focus with the rangefinder. It's of course a little easier with the EVF. And, you know, personally, I feel like the EVF is just another tool in your tool belt. Um, it's helpful to have, you know, sometimes, uh, maybe I had too much coffee that day and I'm just not focusing as well. And sometimes the EVF can kind of bail me out. Um, but it's helpful to have around. Uh, especially and, for lenses. And I like can't that. repeat it often enough, uh, keep keep the windows clean. Yeah, <laughs> That little window is so important, this one and the eyepiece. Uh, and um, because sometimes you have a hard time uh, focusing and uh, it's just looking like through, a, through glasses uh, which have fingerprints on it. So um, uh, this will also help to focus more accurately. Yes, it's a great, great tip. Uh, if you're wondering why things look a little strange or whatever, check, yeah, check the windows, check the viewfinder and the rangefinder. Uh, okay, so we've got a few more, last, last two, and then we'll do some, uh, some audience questions from the, our, our Zoom group here. Uh, so the Q2 and SL2 came with 47 megapixel sensors. Why did the M10 monochrome and now M10R arrive with 40 megapixel sensors? So I mentioned that uh, the 47 are a bit uh, slightly more off the shelf, and this was not a solution uh, for um, the M. Uh, so we decided to go uh, another way uh, to be able to make a yeah, tailor-made, custom-made sensor. So, and one of the reasons is that the M uh, is a very flat camera, um, despite it. Yeah, it has a for a mirrorless camera uh, fairly long back focal length, 27.8 millimeter. So the sensor, the sensor package itself needs to be also very flat. And we could achieve that with that design better. Yeah, that's the reason why we have different resolutions and different sensors in those cameras. Yeah, and, and, and you know, a, ca a camera as compact as the, the Q2, it can be easily thought of as that's a, that's a thin camera as well, but since that's a, a matched, sensor and lens, it's kind of a different yeah. story there, right? There's no focal plane shutter and um, the lens of the Q2 goes all the, yeah, almost uh, till the surface of the, of the sensor because if you don't need to have an interchangeable mount, the freedom to design the lens uh, can be much bigger than um, if you have to respect 
uh, all these distances have a focal plane shutter and so on. Yeah, I'm sure there are m many uh, lens designers that would maybe, maybe they would love to design every lens with a matching camera mounted to it. Maybe that'll make their lives easier. That would be, yeah, but that, that's, I think, at least for Peter Carver, that would be boring. Yeah, <laughs> do that. It's not a challenge. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, one more um, uh, from our, 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 our people in the M10 user group on Facebook. Um, are there any plans for an upgrade service uh, to the M10R like there are for people that want to upgrade their cameras from the M10 to the M10P features? So that, yeah, uh, we, it's not finally decided. Uh, it depends on the requests we get for that. Uh, but on the other hand, as we would have to exchange the sensor and the sensor board, uh, the, uh, the circuit, this would be fairly a, uh, yeah, would be an expensive operation uh, and we need to calculate where that would end up. Uh, I, my gut feeling is that it would be more, yeah, would maybe more beneficial to sell an M10 and get a new M10R, but we'll, we'll look into that. Okay, so if, uh, if people are interested, uh, you know, you got to say, you got to speak up and, and we, we do listen to a lot of user feedback. So, um, you know, I think people have to voice their requests that they are really interested in this. Um, so yeah, little, we'll see, we'll see what happens, but nothing's decided on just yet. It sounds like, uh, so, all right, Stefan, these are, this, this completes our questions from, from our, our LHSA members and, and, and M10 user group, uh, uh fans. Uh, so I've, I've seen some great, uh, questions and, and great, uh, conversation here in our, our zoom call. Um, so let's take a quick look. I'm just going to throw a couple at you, Stefan. Let's see what we've got. I saw some great comments too. So again, I'm really glad everyone's uh, here with us. Um, so can we can do 16 minute long exposures on uh, the M10R and M10 monochrome. Um, is that with the, do you have to keep the uh, long exposure noise reduction on or can you, can you turn it off? Yeah, that's native to the uh, to the uh, sensor design that uh, it cannot be switched off. That would be it's it's actually not really a noise reduction. It's called noise reduction, but it's an artifact prevention uh, because by 16 minutes the sensor will heat up um, fairly 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 nice, and uh, this would give some yeah. Uh, artifacts you 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 don't want to have. So, yes, unfortunately, it needs to have that uh, second second exposure, so to say. Right. No worries. Uh, so we've also got uh, another great question. Um, how does the color compare the M10R with its uh, its 24 megapixel uh, counterparts? Would you say that it's a um, uh, di yeah, different color interpretation or? I would say it's, yeah, personally, I don't think there is a lot of difference. Um, um, what you can see is that you have a greater dynamic. Um, so between the highlights and the shadows, uh, th there's more beef, so to say, uh, or more distance. And um, this, yeah, it doesn't play on color itself, but it, it renders the image a bit different. Yeah. and. Uh, Otherwise, I would I wouldn't. So we did not intentionally change the color um, uh, from twenty four to forty. Mm, gotcha. Um, and yeah, and I think from what I've seen and, and images of, uh, from the M ten R, the colors are quite nice. And uh, you know, I've seen actually after the embargo lifted, I saw some people on Twitter discussing uh, in the journalist circles how uh, many were such a fan of our color science and. Uh, the way that our cameras render uh, straight out of straight out of camera, and I, I must agree. It's, it's yeah, I had, a, I had a, a chat, a similar chat with the Chinese customers, and they were talking about the German taste. I didn't hear that before, but uh, <laughs> obviously, uh, yeah, it's a, it's considered to be a German taste of uh, rendering. Gotcha. Yeah, it's an interesting way of looking at it. Now, okay, something I'll maybe tease you about a little bit. Maybe it's something that's come. Maybe it's very German. The, the camera, we say it's 40 megapixels, it's easy for shorthand. We, we went over uh, much earlier in the hour how it's technically 40.89 million pixels. Um, is, that a, is that a German mentality? We didn't reach 41, so we just call it 40. We had to decide, uh, yeah, um, because if we would have said it's 41, 
and people would look at the data sheet and find out it's only 40.89. So we said 40, yeah. So that's a decision to make. In the fair end, enough, this doesn't, enough. in the end, this doesn't, yeah, doesn't really play a role. It's, yeah, it's a great camera and I, I wouldn't go back to a 24 megapixel, really because um, uh, you don't lose anything and you, you have so much uh, more to crop in. And um, so if you have a 35 on, from now on you also have a 50 on because you can easily crop and have plenty of resolution left. Gotcha. That's a that's a very interesting uh, tidbit, uh, maybe, you know, especially for your, your personal photography. Um, that you feel like you just there's you don't have to go back to 24. You're happy with 40. That's a you know just looking towards uh, towards the future. I, I, I appreciate that, and um, and I kind of have to agree. It's there's there's still a charm uh, to using some older digital models. You know, I used an original monochrome uh, not too long ago, and you know it still of course creates some amazing files and great image. Um, but you know, seeing what we can do now with uh, the latest and greatest, especially in the M10 monochrome. It's it's really it really uh, starts to spoil you a little bit when you come become accustomed yeah. to this. I, I I shouldn't stretch too much on that, otherwise we don't sell fifties and seventy five uh, millimeter lenses anymore. <laughs> yes, people maybe they'll the we they'll just buy a twenty eight and just crop everything. <laughs> oh, that's the Q two. Um, so uh, all right, we've got a few people actually asking, um, curious about about your your own photography and and what you do, what you like, and your own proclivities. Um, what is uh, your favorite? What's your go-to lens and camera uh, for most situations? I would say now maybe it's the M10R, but what's your what's your favorite lens at least? This is my favorite lens, uh, thirty-five. Um, uh, yeah, thirty-five one point four, um, because I'm convinced you can. I can do almost everything with it. Yeah, it's um, nice for um, some landscape uh, architecture if you have enough space. Um, you can even shoot a portrait with it. Uh, you know, like a half uh, half cut. And um, so this is my my standard favorite lens on uh, on any M camera. But I have to say I was uh, kind of uh, addicted uh, by the Noctilux 1.2. So this is a 50, which is usually not my focal length, but uh, I really like that lens because uh, rendering is so special and yeah, beautiful. Yeah, that's and, and for those that, that may not know, um, the 50 1.2 Noctilux, which was the first Noctilux, uh, you know, was also the first aspherical lens put into production ever. Am I right on that, Stefan? Yeah, and into a serial production, that's right. It was um, uh, the first lens containing aspheric lens elements and it must have been a nightmare to produce because I heard that uh, out of 10 lens elements, they have to, had to throw away nine. And so it must not have been a, a great fun to, to produce and sell that lens. So, <laughs> Gotcha. And that's, I mean, that's quite a... That's quite a collector piece. Those are very rare, and for the partially the reason you just mentioned. And I think it's uh, that I, I know that you and uh, and and Yesco have uh, have been maybe sharing one, and it's amazing that you go out and use it, put it through its paces, and see what it does, especially on the latest and greatest sensor now. Uh, so very cool. Again, thank you, Stefan. I really appreciate your your, your questions and your answers, and and everyone uh, from the LHSA to uh, the M10 user group, to everyone here that's been with us. This has been a very enjoyable hour, I hope, at least for me. I hope for everyone as well. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Contact me if you have any, any questions or follow up to this um, or any thoughts on this program. Uh, you know, go visit uh, us.likea-camera.com and likeacamerausa.com for more info and for, uh, for where you can also buy the Leica M10R. Uh, if you don't already have an order in, get one in so you get one as soon as you can. Uh, but yeah, please reach out. Um, Stefan, thank you so much for this. I think it was very insightful. I think uh, I really enjoyed it and I, I think everyone I'm sure has as well. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, and, you know, thank you again for the M10R, for everything that, uh, that you put into your work through all these years. And, and, and it shows in the results and in these, uh, these wonderful tools that are just so much fun to use. Yeah, thank you, uh, Antonio. Thank you all for participating. 
for listening, for taking the time uh, in your lunch break or wherever you are. Um, so, um, yeah, I'd love to, to do that again uh, with maybe some, some, some other new products uh, or in between. So, um, looking forward to many more sessions with you. Thank you for listening and, and watching. Yes, thank you, Stefan. I'll take you up on that. So again, everyone be safe, be healthy, and catch us next time here on Like a Conversations.